Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Welcome to lecture number 22 on measure and integration. Uh, if you recall in the previous lecture, we had started looking at uh, the properties of uh, Lebesgue measure uh, and Lebesgue uh, of Lebesgue integrable functions um, and we started looking at analyzing when does uh, a function which is Lebesgue integrable on the interval a b uh, and its relation with the Riemann integral. Uh, of uh, the functions on the interval a b. So, let us uh, uh, we have started looking at the proof of the theorem namely that if f is a function uh, defined on a uh, interval a b to r which is uh, Riemann integrable then we wanted to show that it is also Lebesgue integrable and the Riemann integral is same as the Lebesgue integral. So, we will uh, 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 continue the proof of that theorem and then go on to analyze some more properties of uh, the space of uh, Lebesgue uh, integrable functions on uh, the interval a b. So, today's lecture is going to be mainly concerned with Lebesgue integral and its properties. So, the theorem we wanted to prove was that if f is a function defined on a interval a b to r and it is Riemann integrable, then it is also Lebesgue integrable and the Riemann integral of the function is same as its um, Lebesgue integral. So, to prove this theorem, um, we started with the, uh, uh, this idea that since f is Riemann integrable, there exist sequences psi n and phi n of step functions on the interval a b such that the sequence psi n is monotonically increasing and is uh, the sequence phi n is monotonically decreasing and the function f is between these two sequences phi n and psi n for all points x belonging to a b and the Riemann integral of psi n uh, converges to the same value as the Riemann, integ uh, Riemann integral of f and it is the same as the limit of um, the integrals Riemann integrals of the step functions phi n. So, let us uh, recall these uh, steps which we had proved last time. So, what we are given is f is a function defined on a interval a b to r and f is Riemann integrable. So, what does the Riemann integrability imply? The Riemann integrability of the function implies the following namely there exists a sequence p n of refinement partitions of the interval a b such that the norm of these partitions goes to 0 and the upper sums of f with respect to these partitions that decreases and the upper sums and the lower sums of f with respect to p n increases and the common value is the integral. So, limit n going to infinity of upper sums is same as integral Riemann integral of f and that is same as the limit of the lower sums. So, this is uh, because f is Riemann integrable. Now, let us see uh, what are the upper sums and what are the lower sums. We need to analyze them uh, slightly more uh, carefully to look at. Uh, so, uh, this is uh, let us draw a picture of uh, the function say uh, say the function looks like this. Okay. So, this is a 
and this is B and we get the partition. So, with respect to a partition, so let us say this is the, the general interval say x i minus 1 and x i. So, in this interval, look at what is the smallest value of the function. So, what is the smallest value of the function that is this. So, look at this height and look at the largest value of the function in that interval. So, largest value of the function is somewhere here. So, look at that height. So, lower sums consist of the areas of these rectangles with height as the blue line and the upper sums consist of the sums of all the areas which are the green lines. So, mathematically what this means is the following. So, let us write uh, mathematically what it means. So, mathematically these things mean the following namely. So, look at consider the function. So, let us uh, write. So, consider let us define define. So, uh, so let us say p, uh, p is the partition say p n is the partition which looks like a equal to x 0 less than x i minus 1 less than x i x n equal to b. So, let us say that is the partition. So, the define uh, let us say uh, m 1 to be the supremum of the function f x x belonging to uh, a that is uh, less than or equal to uh, x uh, x 1 uh, x 1 and let us write m k to be the supremum of the function in the general interval. So, f x for x between x i minus 1 and x i. So, keep in mind here I am taking left open and right close here at the end point is both sides close. So, these intervals are disjoint intervals. So, what I am doing is in the first part I am looking at this then I am looking at left open right close, left open, right close, left open, right close. So, I am partitioning the interval a b according to the partition points p n and then looking at the supremums in the respective intervals. Similarly, let us write m k uh, to be equal to infimum of f x in x, x i minus 1 less than or equal to x i and uh, uh, m 1 to be the infimum in the first interval. So, that is f x x in x 0 x 1. So, what is this value? This m 1 and m k s are corresponding to the uh, the height which is the green line. Okay. So, that is the maximum value of the function in the interval x i minus 1 to x i and the blue ones correspond to small m k s. So, once we have done this mathematically, let us define the required functions. So, let us define phi n is the function which is summation m i indicator function of x i minus 1 to x i i equal to 2 to n and in the first one. So, let us put that value as m 1 the indicator function of a x 1. And similarly, let us write psi n to be sigma i equal to 2 to n capital M i the maximum value in the interval x i minus 1 to x i and capital M 1 in the first interval. So, that is indicator function of a to x 1. So, these are the uh, functions uh, we defined. So, they are corresponding to. So, the function which is phi n small phi n um, will look like the minimum values like this and it will look like. So, it will look like this. 
and the capital uh, uh, and psi n's they will look out like look the maximum values. So, they look like this and look like this and look like this. So, quite clearly they are uh, these functions phi n and psi n are step functions and phi n of x is less than or equal to f of x and less than or equal to psi n of x. So, as a first step the Riemann integrability of the function f over the interval a b gives us a sequence of functions phi n and psi n, where each phi n is a step function, each psi n is a step function and phi n is less than or equal to f of x is less than or equal to psi n of x. And since we our requirement was that um, uh, Riemann integrability implies that the sequence p n of partitions is a sequence of refinement partitions. So, that implies that the sequence psi n will be a decreasing sequence and phi n will be an increasing sequence. So, let us write that observation namely that. So, we have phi n. So, each phi n psi n is a step function phi n s are increasing and psi n s are decreasing. Okay. And moreover further let us look at uh, the Riemann integral of the function phi n x d x a to b. So, because phi n is constant uh, on each sub interval of the partition this is nothing but equal to um, m 1 times the length of the first interval. So, that is x 1 minus a plus the uh, sums of those rectangles. So, that is a small m k times x k minus x k minus 1 k equal to 1 to n. And similarly, um, the Riemann integral of the function psi n x d x is equal to capital M 1 in the first interval times the uh, width of the interval that is x 1 minus a plus k equal to 1 to n the uh, um, areas of the other rectangles. So, that is capital M k times x k minus x k minus 1. Right? So, those are the uh, Riemann integrals and uh, by the definition of the upper and the lower sums, this is precisely the lower sum of f with respect to p n and this is precisely the upper sum of uh, the function f with respect to the partition p n. And saying that the function is uh, Riemann integrable implies that the upper sums and the lower sums converge to the same value. So, uh, this uh, and the Riemann integrability implies that the uh, Riemann integral a to b of phi n x d x limit n going to infinity is same as the Riemann integral a to b f x d x and that is same as the Lebesgue in, uh, same as the Riemann uh, limit of the upper sums. So, that is limit n going to infinity the Riemann integral a to b of psi n x d x. So, that proves our first step. So, as a consequence of the Riemann integrability of the function f, we have constructed two sequences of step functions psi n and phi n, where psi n is monotonically increasing and phi n is monotonically uh, uh, decreasing and limits of both uh, the integrals of both of them converge to the uh, Riemann integral of f. Now, let us observe at this stage. So, in some sense the step functions and the Riemann integrals are the building blocks for the Riemann integral. Now, let us observe that the lower sum of the function f with respect to the partition which was the Riemann sum uh, which was the Riemann integral of phi n is also nothing but the Lebesgue integral of 
the function phi n with respect to the um, Lebesgue integral, because this is uh, this function phi n is a simple function, uh, is a simple measurable function and its integral is nothing but this integral. So, the observation is that for every n integral a to b of phi n x d x the Riemann integral is same as the Lebesgue integral of the function phi n with respect to the Lebesgue integral over the interval a b. And this observation is simply by the fact that phi n is a step function. So, hence it is a simple measurable function that is integral is nothing but uh, the value times uh, the Lebesgue measure of uh, the portion on which that value is taken and that wing here sub intervals. So, it is same as the Riemann integral and similarly, the Riemann integral a to b of psi n x d x is equal to integral over a b of psi n d lambda. So, this is uh, um, the observation which is going to play a important role for us. So, now let us define, let us consider the because we have got the observation that the function f n, uh, the function phi n is always dominated by f x is less than or equal to psi n. So, let us look at the function psi n minus uh, phi n. So, look at the function. So, consider the sequence psi n minus phi n. So, look at the sequence of these step functions. These are step functions as well as they are simple measurable functions and they are non negative. So, they are non negative um, uh, simple measurable functions and by uh, Fatou's lemma. So, we are going to apply Fatou's lemma to this. So, this consider this sequence and apply Fatou's lemma. So, what will that give me? So, that will give me that limit inferior of psi n minus phi n d lambda limit n going to infinity integral over a b. So, the Lebesgue integral of the limit inferior is less than or equal to limit inferior of the integral psi n minus phi n d lambda. Okay. So, that is by Fatou's lemma, but let us observe here that integral of psi n over a b minus integral of phi n over a b, okay, the limit inferior of that is equal to 0, because integrals the Lebesgue integrals of psi n are same as the Riemann integrals of psi n and Lebesgue integrals of phi n are same as the Riemann integrals of phi n and those Riemann integrals converge to the Riemann integral of f. So, this right hand side is equal to, so this is equal to 0. So, that means that the limit inferior of psi n minus phi n that function is a non negative function and its integral uh, Lebesgue integral is equal to 0. So, that uh, uh, we know implies that the function must be 0 almost everywhere. So, this implies that limit inferior of uh, the sequence which is uh, psi n minus phi n x must be equal to 0 almost everywhere x. But we know that psi n's are increasing, uh, psi n's are decreasing and phi n's are increasing. So, this limit inferior is the exists that is that. So, that implies that limit n going to infinity of psi n's is equal to limit n going to infinity of phi n x almost everywhere x. But we know since f of x is between phi n and psi n f x. This implies along with the earlier fact, this implies that limit n going to infinity of psi n x 
must be actually equal to f of x actually equal to limit uh, n going to infinity of psi n of phi n of x for almost all x. So, this must happen, but that implies because each psi n uh, is a uh, measurable function, each phi n is a measurable function, this implies f is uh, measurable. Okay. But recall f was Riemann integrable function, so obviously it is a bounded uh, function, so implies that f is Lebesgue integrable. because f bounded. So, by boundedness of f every bounded uh, uh, measurable function and on this is defined on a b which is a finite uh, uh, sp measure space. So, that must be integrable that we had observed earlier. So, f is Riemann integrable. So, only uh, we have to uh, prove now. So, claim. So, that integral f d lambda over a b is equal to uh, integral a to b of f x d x. So, this is the only thing left to be shown. So, we have what, what we have shown till now is f is Lebesgue integrable. So, this integral exists and now let us observe one thing not only f is uh, Lebesgue integrable it is a limit of uh, a sequence of uh, functions phi n s. Uh, phi n's converge to f of x. Okay, so the sequence phi n is converging to f of x, and psi n's are decreasing to f of x. So whichever fact we require, you can use. So let us use the fact that psi n's are uh, uh, limit of psi n's converge to f of x. They are decreasing, and each psi n is a integrable function. So we can apply um, Lebesgue's dominated convergence theorem to conclude. So, by, domi by dominated convergence theorem, so since psi n x converges to f of x almost everywhere x and psi n s are decreasing and integrable psi n s decreasing psi n s integrable. So, implies by Lebesgue's dominated convergence theorem that uh, integral of f d lambda over a b must be equal to limit n going to infinity of the Lebesgue integral of psi n d lambda. So, that and that is the uh, observation we have already made that the Lebesgue integral of the step function psi n is same as the Riemann integral. So, n going to infinity. So, that is a to b of psi n x d x and this Riemann integral we have observed is the upper sum and which limit is equal to. So, this is the limit of the upper sums of f with respect to p n and that uh, converge to integral d a to b f x d x. So, that will prove that integral Lebesgue integral of f is same as the Riemann integral of f over d lambda. So, that proves uh, the theorem. So, let us uh, uh, go back uh, and uh, recall uh, the proof. The, what are the first step? As a first step in the proof using the Riemann integrability of uh, the function, we construct two sequences of step functions phi n and psi n, such that f is trapped in between them. And the uh, upper sums uh, are nothing but uh, the upper sums are nothing but uh, the Riemann integrals of phi n's uh, of psi n's and the lower integral uh, lower uh, sums are nothing but the phi n's. So, that means, the Riemann integral of psi n uh, converges to the Riemann integral of f and which is also equal to. So, here is the equality sign equal to the Riemann integral of uh, phi n. So, that is this construction is purely uh, from the fact that f n s uh, uh, that the function f is Riemann integrable. And the second observation is that each phi n and psi n being a step function is also measurable and Lebesgue integrable and the Lebesgue integral of phi n is same as the Riemann integral of uh, phi n 
and the Lebesgue integral of psi n is same as the Riemann integral of psi n. So, that is a second observation we make. So, these two uh, integrals, Riemann integrals of the step functions are same as the Lebesgue integrals. And now, because of uh, the earlier uh, consequence that the uh, Riemann integrals of phi n and psi n converge to the Riemann integral of f, look at the difference phi n minus psi n. So, look at that sequence of measurable functions uh, phi n minus psi n that is uh, a, a measurable uh, uh, non negative measurable function and, uh, imp and an application of uh, uh, Fatou's lemma will give us that this psi n and phi n both must converge to the same value and that is f of x almost everywhere. So, that will imply that f is measurable and being uh, a bounded measurable function on a finite measure space, it becomes integrable. And now, the psi n are decreasing to f of x. So, an application of Lebesgue's dominated convergence theorem gives that the Riemann integral of f is same as the limits of the Riemann integrals of psi n, which are equal to the Lebesgue integrals of psi n and that dominated convergence theorem gives you that is the Lebesgue integral of f over the a b. So, that proves uh, the theorem uh, completely namely. So, uh, this is uh, the step we wanted to this was the beginning of our uh, uh, lectures namely we wanted to say that uh, to remove the defects of uh, uh, to remove the defects of uh, uh, Riemann integral namely uh, that uh, the fundamental theorem of calculus may not hold uh, and that the space of Riemann integrable functions may not be complete under what is called the L 1 metric. We wanted to extend the, the notion of uh, integral from Riemann uh, integrable functions to a bigger class. So, we have constructed here a, uh, a class of uh, functions on A b which are called the uh, Lebesgue integrable functions on A b and uh, we have shown that if the class of Riemann integrable functions is a subset of the class of Lebesgue integrable functions and uh, the notion of Lebesgue integral uh, extends the notion of uh, Riemann integral uh, beyond the class of Riemann integrable functions. So, that was uh, uh, the, that is the first step uh, in our uh, extension theory. So, Lebesgue integral is an extension of uh, the Riemann integral. So, as a next step we want to look at. So, uh, uh, the space of Riemann integrable functions are inside the class of uh, Lebesgue integrable functions. And uh, there is, here is a observation which uh, um, one can observe from the proof of this theorem that if a function is Riemann integrable, then it must be continuous almost everywhere. So, uh, to uh, conclude this observation uh, from the proof itself, basically what we have to look at is that the function f is the limit of those step functions right there is the limit of the uh, step functions so so if we leave aside those partition points so we can remember we concluded that f is limit of those step functions phi n and psi n so with that uh, we concluded namely that here so we concluded that uh, uh, this this is this is the fact that we proved in our theorem that the limit of the step functions phi n and psi n uh, uh, is f of x right so that almost everywhere so almost everywhere psi f is limit of psi n and psi n are piecewise continuous functions they are step functions so the points where psi n may not be continuous are possibly the points of the partition points uh, of p n. So, if we pull, pull together all the points partition points, they will be at the most countably many and if you remove them along with this almost everywhere set. So, outside a set of measure 0, this function f will become continuous. So, uh, I am just indicating the uh, possibility of a proof of that. So, those interested probably uh, should look into the, the textbook. And in fact, the converse of this theorem is also true namely that if f is uh, a bounded continuous function 
uh, which is bounded function which is continuous almost everywhere then f is Riemann integrable. So, that means, there is a characterization of Riemann integrable functions in terms of uh, continuity namely a function f is Riemann integrable if and only if it is continuous almost everywhere. So, we are not uh, given the proof of this. So, those interested probably should look into the textbook uh, as mentioned above uh, the in an introduction to measure and integration in which the complete proof is given. But what we have wanted to indicate that the proof of the theorem proof of one part of the theorem namely for a Riemann integrable function it should be continuous almost everywhere is already included in the proof of the fact just now we proved that Riemann integrable implies it is Lebesgue integrable. So, that is uh, one uh, part of uh, the properties of uh, the space L 1 a b that R a b the space of Riemann integrable functions is in L a b. Now, let us look at uh, uh, a metric on L 1 of a b. So, uh, recall we have already shown that um, L 1 of a b a, is a, um, a vector space. We showed that if f and g are uh, integrable functions, then f plus g is integrable, f into g is integrable, uh, uh, alpha times f is integrable. So, it is a linear space. So, it is a vector space over the field of real numbers. So, on this we are going to define a notion of a magnitude. So, for a function f in L 1, we define its what is called the L 1 norm of f to be the integral of the absolute value of f of x d lambda x. So, this is called the L 1 norm of the function f which is in L 1. So, clearly uh, it is a number finite number because f is integrable. So, this right hand side exists and is finite and you are integrating a non negative function. So, the first property namely the norm L 1 norm of a function is bigger than or equal to 0. Uh, for all functions f in L 1 of a b. So, that is obvious. The second property namely supposing uh, this function f is 0 almost everywhere, then clearly integral of uh, uh, the function will be equal to 0 that we have already observed. So, norm will be equal to 0 and conversely if the L 1 norm is equal to 0, then uh, the function uh, absolute value of f of x being a non negative function, it is Lebesgue integral 0 that implies that the function must be 0 almost everywhere. So, the second property namely the norm is equal to 0 if and only if the function is 0 almost everywhere. And the third property which is uh, that if you multiply the function f by alpha, the norm of alpha f is equal to the absolute value of alpha times norm of f and that is obvious because in the definition if you replace f by alpha f then this being a constant the property of the integral. So, the integral of alpha f is equal to mod alpha times integral mod f. So, that gives you the property that the L 1 norm of alpha f is equal to the absolute value of the constant with which you are multiplying alpha mod alpha times uh, norm of uh, f 1. And finally, uh, the triangle inequality property namely if f and g are integrable functions, then we have already shown that f into g is also a integrable function and integral of the absolute value of f plus g will be less than or equal to integral of absolute value of f plus integral of absolute value of g by the triangle inequality of the numbers. So, that will give us that the L 1 norm of f plus g is less than or equal to L 1 norm of f plus L 1 norm of g. So, these are the properties of uh, this uh, uh, magnitude or this uh, norm of f 1. At this stage, I just wanted to point out that this is very much uh, similar to the uh, Euclidean metric or Euclidean norm on R n. See on R n for a vector x with components x 1, x n, we normally define the norm to be equal to, we can take the norm to be equal to sigma mod of x i, i equal to 1 to n. 
So, this is what is called the L 1 uh, norm on R n. And now, so what we are saying is that if x is a vector with n components, then this must be the uh, norm L 1 norm. Now, treat a function f defined on an interval a b to r. So, treat this treat as a vector with components with as many components as points in a b. So, I want to treat this f as a vector with components as many components as points in a b. So, for a point x in a b, what is the xth component of f is nothing but f of x. So, you can treat f of x x belonging to a b as a vector. So, if you treat that way, then what is the L 1 norm of f you would like to define. So, keeping in mind, so take the absolute values of the uh, components. So, take the absolute value of the components. So, this is the component take its absolute value and you want to sum it and the summation is nothing but integral d lambda. So, this is um, uh, in, in that sense this is a perfect generalization of uh, the ordinary uh, L 1 norm on R n. So, the only problem in this is that we do not have the property that if L 1 norm is equal to 0, if and only if f is equal to 0. So, only we have got that uh, the L 1 norm is equal to 0, if and only if f of x is equal to 0 almost everywhere. But uh, let us uh, um, keep in mind that the L 1 norm does not change if we change the function on a null set on a set of measure Lebesgue measure 0. So, with, with that observation in mind, we, we, from now onwards what we do is in L 1 of a b, we identify functions which are equal almost everywhere. So, if two functions are equal almost everywhere, if f and g in L 1 are same uh, are equal almost everywhere lambda, then we treat these functions to be as same. So, with that understanding this becomes a metric d f g which is equal to norm of f minus g um, L 1 norm of f minus g becomes a metric on L 1 of a b and is called the L 1 metric. And uh, the fact we wanted to um, uh, the observation I want to point out is R a b is a subset of L 1 of a b and so R a b as a subspace with L 1 metric is not complete in the L 1 metric. So, that is an observation which uh, you should uh, read from uh, that uh, textbook already mentioned. So, and this was one of the defects of Riemann integral that uh, uh, motivated the uh, development of Lebesgue integral namely the space R a b under the L 1 metric is not a complete uh, uh, metric. So, so this is not a complete uh, uh, metric under the L 1 uh, metric. So, but there is a theorem namely every uh, metric space uh, can be uh, completed. So, there is an abstract theorem in metric spaces that if um, uh, every metric space can be completed. For example, the uh, you look at the uh, set of rational numbers that is not complete under the usual distance of uh, absolute absolute value as a distance and its completion is the real numbers and that is the important uh, uh, property of real numbers that it is complete uh, under that metric. So, similarly, uh, R a b under the L 1 metric is not complete and there is a abstract theorem that R a b can be completed uh, it can be put inside a complete matrix space. What we are going to show is that that completion is nothing but L 1 of a b. So, we are going to prove that 
L1 of AB, the space of all Lebesgue integrable functions on AB, can be realized as the completion of the space RAB under the L1 metric. And this we will be doing in two steps. One, we will show that in the L1 metric, the space L1 AB is complete, that is one, and it to be a completion of RAB, we will show that. R A B sits inside L 1 of A B as a dense subset. So, R A B sits inside L 1 of A B as a dense subset in the L 1 matrix and L 1 is complete. So, that will uh, uh, show that L 1 of A B is uh, a realization of the completion of the space R A B. Like uh, rationals uh, are dense in the real line reals are then uh, real uh, are the field of real numbers is complete so that's why we say that real numbers is the completion of the field of rational numbers so in the similar way we want to prove that l1 of ab is the completion of the space of uh, rab so uh, that means we want to prove that l1 ab in the l1 matrix is complete and rab is dense in it so, the completion part is called the Ries Fisher theorem. So, the Ries Fisher theorem states that L1 of AB is a complete metric space in the L1 metric. So, uh, let us uh, look at a proof of this. So, the proof uh, that to prove that it is a complete metric space, what we have to show? We have to show that every Cauchy sequence Fn in L1 of AB converges to a uh, value in L 1 of A B. Every Cauchy sequence in L 1 of A B is convergent and convergent to uh, a point in L 1 of A B. So, that is what we have to show. So, for that, so let us will to show that, um, so this is what we have to show that there exists some function f in L 1 of A B such that f n minus f L 1 norm converges to 0 as n goes to infinity. So, uh, this to prove this fact, here is an observation. What we will show is, it is enough to show that there exists a subsequence of f n, which is convergent in L 1 norm. So, what we will show is, to show that f n is convergent in L 1 matrix it is enough f n is a Cauchy sequence to show that a Cauchy sequence is convergent, it is enough to show that there exists a subsequence of the, uh, the sequence Cauchy sequence which is convergent that will prove that the sequence is uh, convergent. So, to do that, so we have to produce a subsequence of f n which is convergent to a function in L 1. So, let us look at the first step of our construction. To construct that subsequence, we are going to use the cosiness of uh, 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 cosiness of the sequence f n. So, f n is Cauchy. So, the first step is that saying that the sequence f n is Cauchy implies that I can pick up a subsequence f n k of f n such that the norm of f n minus f n k is is less than 1 over 2 to the power k for all n bigger than or equal to n k. So, to do that, we start with, so what is Cauchyness means? So, saying that the sequence f n is Cauchy, saying that the sequence f n is Cauchy, that means it is same as for every epsilon bigger than 0, there exists some stage n naught such that norm of f n minus f m is less than epsilon for every n and m greater than or equal to n naught. So, that is Cauchyness. So, to start our construction, so, so start, so take epsilon equal to 1 and find n 1 such that norm of f n minus f m is less than epsilon equal to 1 for every n and m bigger than n 1. Okay. So, in particular when m is equal to n 1 that will give me 
So, that is f n minus f n 1 will be less than 1 for every n bigger than or equal to n 1. So, that is the first stage. Okay. So, now supposing, so suppose n 1 less than n 2 less than n k have been constructed, have been found. So, now use Cauchy-Ness. So, find n k such that. So, how do I find n k? So, I will find n k such that norm of f n minus f m will be less than 1 over 2 to the power k for every n and m less than uh, n and m bigger than or equal to find n k plus 1. So, there is the next one we have to construct n k plus 1. So, I will find n k plus 1 such that n k plus 1 is greater than n k and this property holds. So, then for m equal to n k plus 1, I will have f n minus f m k plus 1 will be less than 1 over 2 to the power. So, I can put it k plus 1 also that does not matter k plus 1 for every n bigger than or equal to n k plus 1. So, by induction there exists n 1 less than n 2 less than n k less than so on such that norm of f n minus f n k is less than 1 over 2 to the power k for every n bigger than or equal to n k. So, that is uh, uh, step 1 we do that. So, once that is done we go to step 2 and the step 2 is showing that this subsequence that we have constructed has the property that the sum of the L 1 norms uh, of f n 1 plus the L 1 norm of 1 to infinity of this is finite. Okay. So, that the sums of the L 1 norms of f n 1 plus the L 1 norms of f n j plus 1 minus f n j, j 1 to infinity that is all finite. And that uh, is that follows from the fact that see just now we looked at this. So, that means norm of f n k plus 1 minus f n k is less than 1 over 2 to the power k. Okay. So, if I specialize n to be equal to n k plus 1, then I have, I have this property for every k. So, that implies that if I look at the summation. So, norm of f n 1 plus sigma norm of f n k plus 1 minus f n k k equal to 1 to infinity will be less than or equal to norm of f n 1 plus sigma 1 to infinity 1 over 2 to the power j and that is finite. So, that will prove that the required property step 2 namely sums of norms of these quantities f n 1 and this is the finite. Once that we have, uh, we have that, now I can apply my uh, uh, series form of the Lebesgue's dominated convergence theorem. So, as a step 3, as a next step, I want to conclude that if I look at the corresponding functions f n 1 x plus summation j 1 to infinity f n j plus 1 x minus f n j x, then this series is convergent almost everywhere. Okay. So, that is precisely uh, follows from the uh, series form of the Lebesgue's dominated convergence theorem. So, if I look at this uh, series, then I know that L 1 norms of this series is finite. So, that is precisely the perfect situation where the series form of the Lebesgue's dominated convergence theorem applies uh, and says that these functions they must the series must converge um, almost everywhere. So, this sum must exist almost everywhere and if we denote the sum by f of x then f of x equal to this exists almost everywhere and 
it also says that that function is actually a integrable function and integral of f is equal to integral of f n 1 plus uh, integral of the sums uh, of the corresponding series. So, this integrals of f is equal to integral of f n 1 plus this series. So, we have located a function f and now is only to claim that the, the difference f minus f n j uh, goes to 0 that the f is the limit of that subsequence. So, let us look at. So, note that uh, if we look at um, f minus f n j that is precisely equal to summation j equal to uh, uh, k equal to j uh, sorry uh, let me um, n j. So, that means, k equal to n j plus 1 of f n k minus f n k minus 1. 1. So, the difference between f and f n j is nothing but the tail of the series uh, with the um, terms f n k minus f n k minus 1. So, norm of f minus f n j L 1 norm is going to be less than or equal to summation norm of f n k minus f n k minus 1 from k from the stage n j plus 1 onwards and that is the tail of the convergent series uh, geometric series 1 over 2 to the power j. So, that goes to 0 as j goes to infinity. So, that will complete the proof that hence the f minus f n j goes to 0 as j goes to infinity. So, that will prove that uh, the subsequence f n j is convergent. So, let us just go to go back to the uh, uh, proof once again. Basically, uh, the proof uh, requires uh, one observation namely to show that a sequence a Cauchy sequence is convergent, it is enough to produce a subsequence which is convergent and that subsequence is produced in such a way that by using the Cauchyness, we produce that subsequence with the property that the norms of the consecutive uh, terms of that subsequence are less than uh, 1 over 2 to the power j. Once that is done, we apply the series form of the uh, Lebesgue dominated convergence to conclude that the sum of uh, f n 1 x plus summation f n j plus 1 x minus f n j that exists almost everywhere that is a integrable function and the integrals converge. And once we have that, it is obvious that norm of f minus f n j goes to 0, because once we subtract that the remaining thing uh, is a tail of the series uh, 1 over 2 to the power j and that must go to 0. So, with that we prove the Ries Fisher theorem. So, uh, today we analyze uh, two important things namely one that uh, the space of Riemann integrable functions is inside the space of Lebesgue integrable functions uh, um, Lebesgue integrable on the interval a b and the notion of uh, Lebesgue integral extends the notion of Riemann integral. So, that was one property and the second property we observed that the space of Lebesgue integrable functions on the interval a b under the L 1 metric is a complete metric space. So, and we will con continue uh, this analysis tomorrow and we will show that the space of Riemann integrable functions which is inside the space of Lebesgue integrable functions sits inside as a dense subset and that will prove that L 1 f a b is the completion of the space of Riemann integrable functions. Thank you.